Mike Purley, probably more than anyone else, uh, in fact, more than anyone else, hands down, is responsible for our Constitution Day program, uh, the Constitution Day program over the course of four years, and the consistently extremely high quality of that program, which I think benefits not only the court, but I'm sure all of you and all of us that have the opportunity to participate in Constitution Day. So Michael, thank you on behalf of all of us this afternoon for all the work that you have done. I'll take the opportunity to explain to you what really goes into putting this program together uh, when we uh, wrap things up at lunch. But Your Honor, Judge Scredney, thank you very much for the kind words, and may it please the court and honorable judges and guests. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Anthony O'Rourke. He's a professor at the UV Law School. When you put a program like this together, one of the things you hope to find is somebody that can, can take this topic and really understand it and be able to communicate it. And one of the ways that people can do that, and one of the ways that Professor O'Rourke has done it, is to have a career that has involved him uh, both as a lawyer, after graduating from the prestigious Columbia Law School, he was a practicing attorney. He also became a law clerk, not only to a district court judge, but to a circuit court judge, a circuit court of appeals judge, where it was his responsibility to assist the court in determining issues and resolving issues and seeing both sides of the story. But when you come to a, a program like today where we talk about assembly and protest, uh, I was fortunate to find out that Professor O'Rourke, and this is not in his biography, but has participated in these protests. So if there were one person that I could have selected in the city of Buffalo to give you the best perspective on constitutional issues that are presented before us today, it would have been Professor O'Rourke, and it is my pleasure to introduce him now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Purley, for that wonderful introduction, and especially for all of your work uh, hosting and organizing this, uh, this program today. And I also want to thank Mr. Coppola for sharing uh, those powerful images of individual conflicts that he has witnessed between protesters and law enforcement officers in Attica and a prison on college campuses that have given rise to real social, political, and I'm going to argue today, constitutional change. Now I'm going to say another uh, few names that might also evoke powerful images for some of you. Uh, these names are Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Trayvon Martin. If you've heard of any of these names, if they evoke any feelings in you, maybe fear, maybe a sense of injustice, maybe anger, it is probably thanks to ordinary citizens exercising their constitutional right to protest. These protests have taken many forms. You may have read activists reporting on Twitter from the front lines in places like Ferguson, Missouri, and Baton Rouge. You may have seen people marching in the streets in your neighborhood to protest police brutality. Maybe some of you have even marched yourselves. You may have seen Colin Kaepernick take a knee during the national anthem. Maybe you disagreed with his choice. Maybe you didn't. Either way, you probably listened to what he had to say about his perceptions of police violence in this country. These protesters, including perhaps you, might not agree on what should be done to address the problems of police violence, but they have organized very effectively around a common theme, Black Lives Matter. Today, I want to talk about how the Black Lives Matter movement connects to the Constitution. What does it have to do with the Constitution? I want to talk about how the Constitution shapes movements like Black Lives Matter, but I also want to talk about how movements like Black Lives Matter shape the Constitution. And this second question is the one I want to focus on, on how protesters, including protesters your age, are shaping the Constitution. I'm going to argue 
that the right to protest is what enables students like you to make the Constitution a stronger, more vital, better reflection of the values that make our country worth celebrating. Of course, um, as Judge Scott uh, am, am helped, uh, lucidly described, the United States Supreme Court has the power to shape the Constitution's meanings with decisions like Brown versus Board of Education, but the right to protest is the instrument by which you can make sure the Constitution's promises are realized. And I'm going to make this argument by talking about constitutional law, uh, but also by sharing one of my experiences as a protester, marching in New York City in response to the death of Eric Garner, who, for those of you who don't, don't know, was killed by the police while he was being arrested on the street for selling loose cigarettes. I want to use this experience to help build an argument about how protesters are helping to reshape our understanding of the Constitution, and particularly of what the Constitution says about policing and racial profiling. But before I do this, I want to take a moment to thank um, both Aboda and the Robert H. Jackson Center for co-hosting this event, and especially to thank Judge Scrutney um, for sharing some of his experiences of protests uh, in law school, and also for hosting us in open court to talk about these issues. It is a testament to Judge Scrutney's commitment to the Constitution and to this program that he had just one substantive suggestion with respect to this speech, and that is that you leave the courtroom today knowing what your rights are if you decide to engage in protest. And I couldn't agree more uh, that this is the most valuable information I could impart. So let me briefly go over some points that you should keep in mind and take away with you. First, the First Amendment of the Constitution protect, uh, provides that the government cannot abridge your freedom of speech, as you know, and in practice. This means that the government cannot restrict your right to protest based on the opinions that you are trying to communicate. This does not mean that you have the right to incite your fellow citizens to commit crimes. Uh, the Supreme Court has said in Brandenburg v. Ohio that the government may restrict public speech that is, and here I quote, directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. That means that your protest may cross a line if you are actively encouraging others to violate the law. If you are encouraging other audience members to single someone out and harm them, the police may step in. But they may not step in because they dislike your opinion. And I'm going to come back to this aspect of the free exercise clause. The First Amendment's viewpoint neutrality, as lawyers call it, in just a moment. Second, the First Amendment gives you the right to peacefully assemble. That means that you have the power to organize together and protest in streets, public parks, and other places known in the case law as traditional public forums. For some large protests, the government may require organizers to apply for permits, but the government may do not deny a permit simply because it dislikes the protesters' message. And even if you don't have a pro permit, you may still march on sidewalks and conduct a protest that does not interfere with the day-to-day -day activities of your fellow citizens without being arrested. Of course, police may patrol a march to ensure public safety. You uh, may be stopped by a police officer. So if you are, during a protest, you should stay calm, you should be respectful, you should not resist or run away, but you are entitled to respectfully point out that the First Amendment protects your right to peacefully protest. You may also ask the officer if you are free to leave. And if the officer says yes, that means you are not under arrest and you can calmly and quietly walk away. If you are arrested, you may ask the officer why you are being arrested, but otherwise it is a good idea to remain silent Memorize a phone number of someone you want to call, ideally a lawyer, but otherwise someone who you can rely on to uh, answer the phone and get in touch with the lawyer on your behalf. Maybe even write the number down on your hand using indelible marker. For more information, check out the ACLU's webpage on the rights of protesters. It's a great summary of your constitutional protections, and it was helpful to me in summarizing those protections to you today. And these tips form the core of how the Constitution protects your rights as a protester, how the Constitution shapes protest. But now I want to move on 
to discuss how movements like Black Lives Matter shape the Constitution. I want to start with the fact I mentioned earlier that the government may not restrict your right to protest based on the opinion you hold. That is to say, the First Amendment is viewpoint neutral. There are reasonable people who think that this neutrality is unwise. It means that the same First Amendment that protects your right to protest also protects the rights of people with hateful and intolerant views to protest. That case I mentioned earlier, Brandenburg v. Ohio, in that case, the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment protected the KKK's right to hold a rally at which protesters burned a cross and shouted horrifying racial slurs about African Americans, Jews, and other minorities. Should we celebrate a vision of the First Amendment that gives them just as much of a right to burn a cross as it gives you the right to march in opposition to cross burning? It isn't stupid or unpatriotic to ask this question. Indeed, the First Amendment was not originally understood at the founding to be viewpoint neutral. The same founding fathers who ratified the First Amendment also supported sedition laws that punished people and subjected them to imprisonment for criticizing the government. In the 20th century, however, the Supreme Court decided that the First Amendment should protect the views of radicals who wish to criticize or even overthrow the government. And in my view, it is this aspect of the First Amendment, even though you can disagree with it, but the viewpoint neutrality of the First Amendment, and with it the power to protest your government, that gives the document its vitality. It is what makes the right to protest a valuable instrument for students like you to become agents of constitutional change. And as you know, and as Judge Scrutiny reminded us, the Constitution is a changing document. When it was ratified, it was understood to permit slavery. And it was later understood to permit racial segregation of every aspect of public life, including where you lived, where you went to school, even whom you could marry. When individuals organized to challenge these practices, they were challenging what people in power thought the Constitution meant. For example, the Fugitive Slave Act required law enforcement officers in, in states that had abolished slavery to capture returned and return escaped slaves back to their owners. When Frederick Douglass risked his life to speak in public in opposition to this law, he was challenging an idea of the Constitution that treated African Americans as property. In his words, he was challenging the idea that by ratifying the Constitution, our fathers entered into a covenant for slave catching. Over a century later, Dr. King wrote from his Birmingham jail cell to challenge a segregationist government that attempted to suppress nonviolent protests using attack dogs and police beatings. <coughs> he wrote that, and I quote again, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because his quest may precipitate violence. In other words, Dr. King was challenging a vision of the First Amendment that permitted the government to attack you because it didn't like your message. These citizens used protests to change our public perceptions of the Constitution. And these perceptions, these changes in perception, were later reflected in constitutional amendments and in Supreme Court decisions, like Brandenburg, that made the Constitution a better document. Their examples show that if protesters are smart, if they are organized, and if the message that they are conveying resonates with our best selves, they can change our perception of what the Constitution should be. And this brings me back to the question I started with. How do movements like Black Lives Matter protect and shape the Constitution? And here, I'd like to start answering the question by sharing my thoughts on a Black Lives Matter protest that I attended in New York City. It was a December day, a sunny one, and thousands of us gathered in downtown Manhattan to march through the city. Apart from the beautiful weather, one of the things that struck me the most about that day and about the march was the clarity of vision of the organizers. Organizers who were not much older than you. I didn't attend that protester as a law professor. I attended it as a citizen standing alongside other citizens. Some of the citizens that I was standing alongside were powerful, prominent politicians, very respected members of the clergy, I saw a few famous constitutional lawyers, 
and there were other people there in positions of public influence. Some of the citizens that we were standing alongside included high school students who didn't yet have the right to vote, and some of the citizens we were standing alongside weren't even in the legal sense citizens. They were immig recent immigrants to the United States who were trying to make their adopted country a better place. And we were all being led, powerful politicians, high school students, non-citizens, by men and women only a few years older than you. Men and women who were committed to making change. Now, what does the change that they were trying to affect have to do with the Constitution? I think a great deal. That day we were protesting the death of Eric Garner, but what sort of change were we trying to make in Eric Garner's name? Not everyone attending the protest would have agreed. Indeed, by its very nature, a successful protest brings people together who do not agree on the details of everything. Uh, one organizer, Netta Elzey, eloquently characterized the message of, the, of Black Lives Matter by saying, our demand is simple, stop killing us. Other protesters that day were not as eloquent. A small fraction of the protesters gained outsized media attention by shouting for the death of cops. This was an embarrassing and, in my view, horrifying exercise of the right to protest, and it was a harmful one. It sought to devalue the lives of the many police officers that struggle every day to do the right thing by the communities they serve. And devaluing lives is the opposite of what the organizers that day and what, the opposite of what the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to accomplish. And the core message of the protest, opposition to pre police brutality, is deeply connected to the Constitution. I talked about the Constitution as a document that has been improved by the actions of protesters like Frederick Douglass and Dr. Martin Luther King. We shouldn't assume that their work is done. When protesters are speaking out against police violence, they are asking for a different kind of policing. They are asking for a more just and indeed more reasonable kind of policing. And here I come to my experience as a, a criminal procedure professor. As a criminal procedure professor, this demand for reasonable policing calls to mind a particular constitutional provision that is deeply relevant to how police do their jobs and how we live our lives, and that is the Fourth Amendment. This amendment provides, in part, that, I quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. So one question we might ask, and this question has significant ramifications for millions of citizens, is whether the Fourth Amendment prohibits a police officer from stopping and searching a person because of their race. Suppose that a police officer spots a driver making a right turn without using a signal. That's a traffic violation. And the officer would have objective grounds to pull that driver over and to give him a warning, maybe even give him a ticket. Now suppose that that driver who violated the traffic laws happens to be African American and that if he had been white, he would not have been pulled over. Indeed, suppose that the traffic violation was just a pretext. The officer didn't care about the right-hand turn. The officer is pulling the driver over because he was African-American, or because the fact that he was African-American led the officer to think he had drugs on him. Does it violate the Fourth Amendment for police officers to make that traffic stop? The Supreme Court asked, addressed this very question in Wren versus United States. There, a police officer used a traffic violation, a right-hand turn without a signal, as a pretext for pulling over an African-American driver. And as it turned out, that particular driver was carrying crack cocaine. And the Supreme Court had to decide whether the driver could be convicted based on evidence that the police officer seized during that traffic stop. But the broader question that the Supreme Court was addressing, whether the, Supreme, the Fourth Amendment prohibits pretextual stops, whether it prohibits racial profiling, isn't just relevant to people who commit crimes. It is relevant and has significant implications for millions of law-abiding men and women of color. And there is certainly a good argument to be made that the Fourth Amendment prohibits racial profiling 
of the kind that occurred in Wren. Maybe you're making the arguments in your head right now. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches. And most people would agree that it is unreasonable to stop a person because of their race. But in Wren, the Supreme Court decided that the Fourth Amendment does not prohibit pretextual traffic stops, and with it that the Fourth Amendment does not prohibit racial profiling. According to the court, the Fourth Amendment does not give judges license to inquire into the subjective motivations of police officers conducting a stop. The relevant question under the Fourth Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, is whether as an objective matter the police officer has probable cause to make a stop. So if a driver makes a right-hand turn without using a signal, the police officer objectively has probable cause to stop that driver for a traffic violation. Easy, easy enough. It does not matter for the Supreme Court if the actual reason for the stop was to look for drugs. It does not matter if the reason why the driver, or rather why the officer suspected that the driver had drugs was because the driver was black. By now, some of you are thinking, look, regardless of whether the Fourth Amendment permits this type of racial profiling, it is certainly unconstitutional, and you're correct. In Wren, the Supreme Court emphasized that even if racial profiling doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment, which was ratified in 1791, it violates the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws, which was ratified after the Civil War. The problem is that as a procedural matter, it is very difficult to win an equal protection claim based on a police officer's selective enforcement of the laws. As a practical matter, it doesn't happen. And that means that the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment is the one that shapes how police officers and people of color interact in everyday life. And the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to make those day-to-day -day encounters between police and people of color real for those of us who, like myself, feel comfortable in the presence of police officers, in part because of our race and in part because of our social position. By making these encounters real, young protesters are challenging the assumptions that supported the Supreme Court's reasoning in cases like Wren. By organizing around a powerful and well-crafted message, protesters your age are becoming new voices for constitutional change. Some of you may go to law school. I suspect a good number of you are thinking about it. Perhaps one of you will be sitting where these judges are today, or even sitting on the United States Supreme Court. Certainly, those positions will give you the power to influence the Constitution. But you do not have to wait until you graduate from law school. You don't even have to wait until you graduate from high school to help bring our constitutional doctrine into conformity with your best understanding of the Constitution's values. Your rights as a protester give you the power to help make constitutional change and to continue the work of visionaries like Frederick Douglass and Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor O'Rourke. Uh, I mean, it goes without saying, and, and I'm, I'm sure nobody would dissent or disagree that you fulfilled your keynoter charge to the ultimate, to the very ultimate. Uh, I think what you made happen for all of us was bring to life the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and bring it home to our everyday lives. So thank you very, very much for your presentation doing that and being here with us today.